Here. Um, Emma? Here. Um, Kristen? Here. Jill? Here. Andrew? Here. Mia? Here. Jerry? Here. Uh, let's see, Libby made it. Um, so, uh, first order of business is public comment. Um, for those on the phone, the way we do this is if you hit the participant button uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand function there. That is the best way to do it. If you can't figure that out, um, you just kind of physically wave your hand in the camera, or if that fails, um, kind of shout out and we'll put you in queue. Right now, I'm not seeing any comments. So I've got a good crowd. Um, all right, excellent. We will move on to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, I move to approve the consent agenda with the additions of the new hire. Uh, paperwork we received today and the increase of a 0.2 FTE in the high school English department. Thank you. Um, okay. Any discussion? I, I have a question for Libby. Um, the on the warrants, the accounts payable for 430 is, is a bit larger than the one for 416. It, do you know what the reason for that is? I don't. I'm sorry. Grant does okay. the warrants. Okay. I, can, I can text him and find out. But... They do frequently vary. So. Yeah, maybe it's just that seeing two side by side made it stand out. All right. Um... So, Atticut, the air nay, or I or nay, or whatever it is. Aye. Emma. Aye. Uh, Kristen. Aye. Jill. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Mia. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Uh, excellent. Uh, I'm oh, here. Jim. I'm, Amanda's here. <laughs> oh, hi, Amanda. Hi. Hi. Great. Thank you. And um, that's basically all we did was public comment and consent agenda. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Emma to introduce the uh, School Safety and Police Relations uh, Committee presentation. I just want to say in advance, uh, really looking forward to this. And thank you uh, in advance to, for the members for all the great work on this. Um, I know that this committee has spent an incredible amount of time uh, giving this issue thought and consideration and has put in a ton of work. So um, I really look forward to, to hearing from you all. So with that, and I want to give a special shout out to Emma because I know she has worked really hard at chair to, to coordinate this. Um, so um, Emma, take it away, please. Yeah, I was going to also start by just thanking everybody because we've been meeting since October. I think everybody put in more time than they initially thought that it would take. And um, we ended up meeting pretty much weekly for two hour meetings. And um, it was a heavy lift and and sort of emotional and stressful. And um, everyone who helped was incredible. And so I want to um, read off the names of the committee members that I believe are here tonight. Zach Henningsen, Edie D'Onofrio, Eliana Moorhead, Susan Koch, Amanda Payne, Jennifer Wall Howard, Jay Erickson, Joan Javier Duval, William Alexander, Catherine Nunnally, and Mia Moore. So some people weren't able to make it tonight, but, um, but most of us are here. And one of the um, 
strongest core values that we keep coming back to to ground ourselves is to stu um, center student voice. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to the three student representatives of our team, um, Zach, Edie, and Eliana. And I believe I have screen share privileges, so I will share the presentation. Hi, so uh, while Emma's getting that started, um, I'll just kick us off. Um, we are the School Safety and Public Relations Committee and we're presenting on the second half of our charge. And Zach is going to elaborate on the halves of our charge right after me. But in short summary, we've gone over some recommendations on what to do going forward, and we've put together this presentation about it. Zach? Um, so our first bit of the charge was to make a recommendation in regards to the school resource officer position. Um, and we presented that bit of our charge on February 13th. And as you all probably know, um, the board voted to remove the position. So this led us to the second part of our charge, which um, was to fill any possible gaps left by the absence of the SRO and deal with any concerns um, from the community. Um, and this is what we found. And I'm going to pass it. Oh, yeah. So the, the ways that we determined these recommendations was by really focusing on the current policies we have and seeing where the gaps are. And one of the larger gaps is that we don't actually have a conflict resolution policy. So we'll be talking about that later. And along with analyzing current policies, we talked with experts in restorative justice and trauma, racial trauma informed practices, and got a lot of good information from them. And we also researched methods used in other schools that have um, gotten rid of their SRO as well. So, yeah. And all of these recommendations are grounded in the core values that we presented at the previous meeting, and we will jump into those right now. Is the presentation looking okay to everybody? It looks good, yeah. Emma. This is Andrew. Um, I couldn't hear Eliana very well. Um, I think maybe where the computer is positioned. Yeah, she's a little soft for me too. Do you want her to repeat what she said? No, I, I think I think I got it, but um, just for future reference. Yeah. Okay. And that is my cue. Um, so as Eliana said, the work of the School Safety and Police Relations Committee has been guided by values and ideals that initially emerged from our extensive communications with the wider community. Um, and we presented those same six core values um, the last time we presented to this board. Um, they are grounded in a shared sense of restorative justice, empathy, and compassion in the necessity of student agency and voice, and in an understanding of plurality capable of adapting to a broad range of individual perspectives, experiences, and developmentally appropriate behaviors. For this final presentation, we have also articulated a number of both general goals and specific actions to undertake in order to further these same ideals and continue to foster a more inclusive educational environment. So we now offer those same values as a vision for the future, which we hope and trust that the Montpelier Roxbury School Board will continue to uphold. Thank you for your service to the wider community that we all represent in this work and in this moment to ensure that, quote, our schools are caring, creative and equitable communities that empower all children to build on their talents and passions to grow into engaged citizens and lifelong learners. So the first of the six core values grounding the work accomplished and the work to come is justice rooted in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the original value from last time, we acknowledge the weight of history, the realities of inherited privilege, and the urgent need to actively embrace anti-racist practices 
in matters of equity and justice for all members of this community. Moving forward, discipline and mediation must be grounded in the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Current policies and practices should be reexamined through an equity lens. The use of trauma-informed practices and restorative justice should be upheld with consistent fidelity throughout the entire school community. The second core value is compassion, empathy, and belief in each other. We prioritize community and our relationships with each other. We care for one another by seeking to understand each other's perspectives and by working through initial reactions to recognize each other's humanity. We believe we each have important contributions to make to our community and we support each other in doing so. To develop a culture of trust, educators, learners, and staff must show empathy for each other and the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools community must allow for student voices to be heard. Students should have agency in decision making and conflict resolution and their input honored, respected, and taken seriously. Shared leadership opportunities within systems will be explored and implemented in order to dismantle an authoritarian approach. And our third core value is nonviolent communication built on strong relationships. Nonviolent communication and restorative practices among educators, learners, and staff rely on strong, healthy, trusting relationships. These relationships start with listening for understanding, which leads to respecting each other's differences and valuing each other's voice. Regular evaluations will show Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools level of proficiency in these areas. At our first, very first meeting together as a committee, one of the students said something that has stuck with me. She said that we spend a lot of energy putting people in boxes, labeling people, which can cause division. Strong relationships and nonviolent communication break down the barriers we create to allow for healthy connections and unity. We provided you with some tangible and practical actions our school community can take, is already taking, to build strong relationships and encourage nonviolent communication, such as encouraging, supporting, attending, and participating in annual activities and events that provide excitement, connection, celebrate community, and instill a spirit of generosity. Encouraging student, staff, and caregiver buy-in and participation. Unifying the framework for the way all Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools function when possible, to provide scaffolding as students move from grade to grade and school to school, becoming proficient in restorative justice practices by evaluating through feedback from participants, and ensuring comfort and confidence in receiving and providing feedback. And the middle school is already doing this through its Equity Alliance and a, an anonymous form that they've created. Okay. Um, Fourth core value that we have is student voices. Montpelier Roxbury public school system is a student centered learning community which values student voice and creates opportunities for their participation in decision making. Um, this includes and should continue to include perhaps further events coordinated by students and adjusted per student input, student presence in the voice of the community, teaching students to use their voice so they understand they're a powerful stakeholder from a young age, and understand and utilize the ability to voice their opinions, disagree and discuss together and in the broader community, and foster student understanding of their agency and their own safety. Um, our fifth core value is physical safety. No student will have any fear of bodily harm, punitive threats, intimidation, or retaliation from fellow students, faculty, or staff. Students must be able to know they can enter school and be safe while there, to know that they can share their experiences, knowledge, and opinions with each other and teachers with confidence, can be themselves without apology, can bring a complaint and work through conflict without worry of retaliation, and can trust each other and the adults in their school. The sixth core value um, is that system-wide standards and nuanced approaches recognize and support an individual's whole well-being. The original text, we set system-wide standards based on a broad range of individual perspectives and experiences. We understand that individual experiences will affect how we approach meeting the standard. We bring a holistic trauma-informed approach to accountability 
and resolution of conflict in order to strengthen each individual and our community well-being. For the future, district-wide standards of conduct and conflict resolution will be based on an understanding of plurality, accommodating a broad range of individual perspectives, experiences, and developmentally appropriate behaviors. Teachers, administrators, and school staff should have a variety of approaches and skills at their disposal, which we know they do, including trauma-informed practices and an adequate understanding of neurodiversity. Every member of the community should understand both their rights and their responsibilities within these standards of conduct. Thank you, Will and Catherine and Edie. Um, so I'm going to um, share what the committee has come up with as far as uh, policy recommendations for the board. As we all know, the board is responsible for setting district policy. This is, and policies are the avenue through which we set the expectations and standards for the district um, in our role as representatives of our community. And that's the context for these recommendations. Um, we reviewed each of our policies that the board has set, um, policies that we've set for ourselves as board members, for the staff, for students, um, through the lens of these values to see what might be missing and to see uh, which policies we should prioritize for updating. Um, and one that we have identified that the district doesn't have and really could use is a conflict resolution policy. Um, we don't have anything that sets standards or a vision for what the district's approach is when someone doesn't meet the expect expectations for behavior. And in the past, this would or could have been called or referred to as a disciplinary policy. Um, framing it as such anymore doesn't really reflect our community's values around safety and justice or the approach that teachers and administrators are currently taking when it comes to addressing unexpected behavior and resolving conflicts. Um, and I just want to note Jen Wall Howard, the vice principal at uh, Montpelier High School, who um, was part of the working group around policy review with me, was very helpful in reframing this for us. Um, uh, so um, thank you for that, Jen. Um, and because the district doesn't no longer has a formal relationship with the police department, um, it seems there isn't really any reason for a, an MOU and instead, it could be within this conflict resolution policy that we set the expectations for police involvement um, when it comes to conflicts um, on our campuses. Um, and that was the one um, key policy that we saw as we don't have and we need. Um, and then as you can see here on the slide, there are uh, about 10 or so policies that are cur as currently written could really um, benefit from being updated. Um, through the lens of these val of our values around safety and justice. Um, every single one of the ones on this list would really benefit from um, uh, sort of up at the top an overarching policy statement that brings in um, the, the community's values and articulates the learning environment that this policy is meant to support. Um, and then I'm not going to go through because we have our um, the, the like a full text of, of policy recommendations and more details on every single one that is linked from this slide. So available to all the board members and available on our website. I'm not gonna go through every single one of these with the, the details that we found. Um, I just wanted to pull out the, um, the school board expectations one just sort of as an example. Um, and to note that one of the key lessons that we've learned in this process that is reflected in our values as um, Will, Catherine, and Edie just named, is that safety is really built on relationships, trust, and open communication. So while it might seem like a policy that we've written for board members to set expectations for board members doesn't, you know, fully like link up with or is connected to um, safety in our schools, we really feel that it's important for the board to be leading by example um, in how we communicate with each other and with the community. Um, to help set that foundation uh, for what safety can be built on. Um, I'm ready for the next slide of some things we ask the board to consider when um, either writing a new policy or, re or updating the ones that we've uh, offered need updating. 
Um, first off, we really encourage the board to use the, these values around safety and justice as sort of a North Star um, and that and see our policies as um, essentially how we live out that vision. And we especially encourage the board to challenge ourselves um, to go further on centering student voice and student perspectives in our policies and our procedures um, because the students and their success are the reason that we that we exist. Um, the another consideration and thing that we found in reviewing our policies is that we can really be best articulating the learning environment that we aspire to by using positive language and framing in our policies. Again, I want to give a little credit to Jen Wall Howard for noting this. A lot of our policies, if not all of them, use may not, shall not, cannot as more of the dominant frame. And we feel we'd be better setting the tone and truly putting these values into action with positive language that focuses on opportunities for doing well and the support that we provide each other for getting there. Of course, this doesn't mean that the may nots will be eliminated entirely because some things, you know, policies do need to name what is um, unacceptable. Uh, but it, it's our recommendation to lean more into the positive visioning and language in writing our policies. Um, the next thing to, for the board to consider is that policy is where accountability lives in our district. And this includes in the gathering, the review, and the analysis of any data that would support measuring progress toward compliance with the policy. Um, so we really encourage policy language that seeks out data that we need in order to make sure we're making progress and directs the board to draw learnings from it. Um, another thing to consider is that the, the um, district administrators update the school handbooks every summer. And while our policy sets the vision and the high level district wide expectations, it's building leadership then you know, looks to those to, when um, thinking about what, what procedures ought to be in handbooks. Um, so that's an important thing for the board to keep in mind when updating policy. And then we also really want to encourage that when that review process happens, we use the value of um, student voice and student centering so that in reviewing and updating handbooks, they are as inclusive of staff and student voice as possible. Um, and uh, that, 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 you know, to em employ different ways of, of making that happen. Um, the, the next thing to consider is um, that, you know, we learned through this process that each of our schools is engaging in restorative justice practices that are appropriate for where the students are at developmentally and that all of it is a real work in progress um, and, and that, you know, really in the best sense of that phrase. And so we encourage that to maintain that progress and momentum, each school include goals for the res restorative justice practice work within their continuous improvement plans and their annual goals. Um, this is something that possibly the district conflict resolution po policy could support, um, support that and support there being some continuity as students move from one school to another, um, really leaning into that sixth core value of setting system-wide standards that, plus a nuanced approach based on where individuals are at. Um, and then lastly, not necessarily a consideration when writing or updating any policy, but it came to our attention and, and you know, we realized through this process that most, <clears throat> most of our community is not familiar with district policies. Um, and so we're, we're just kind of tossing out the question of how can the board do better at communicating them and using our policies to support this vision of a supportive and equitable learning community and really engaging our community in, in being a part of that. Okay, so this next slide, um, Zach and I are going to uh, present some recommendations for budget recommendations. Um, and I guess this slide's sort of hard to read. I think the print's a little small. Um, but these recommendations are grounded in our core values and in our district's diversity and equity and inclusion policy. Um, so the first budget recommendation that we have, actually the idea came to us from Libby Bowen Steele and we talked about it um, as a committee and then also addressed this idea of a community liaison position with the school social workers. And we are recommending that the that the district hire one to two social workers 
to provide targeted and dedicated support to our students and families who are really struggling with truancy. And so the community liaison position would be solely dedicated to that. Um, we have a number of families that are struggling with truancy that could really use a, a person that could really do intensive family work and wrap around those families to help get them to school. And the idea behind this, uh, the, the funding would come from the ESSER monies that are coming for recovery, COVID recovery, and it would be a two year grant funded position. And our recommendation is to really collect data so that after two years, we can see how effective it has been as a position. And if it has shown to be effective, then we can use that data to help um, fund that continuing into the future. And oh, and there's a document linked at the bottom. I'm not gonna go into details, but in that document, we have um, put down more details of what, what should be included in that position. Um, we didn't write up an actual job description, but there's a lot of bulleted points that we think should be included um, for your, your reference. Zach, I'll pass it to you. Um, I also want to highlight uh, trainings um, for all professionals and staff within um, Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. So custodians, cafeteria workers, like everyone possible, um, we would like to prioritize um, restorative practices, trauma-informed practices, resili resiliency, conflict resolution, resolution, and diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. Um, we want to. We also want to recognize that there are a lot of um, restorative practice trainings that are being taken um, by teachers and staff as a whole. Uh, but we wanted to really make sure that that is highlighted um, for everyone, like even bus drivers. Um, so just the wide range of people there. Um, and we also would like to um, formalize a relationship with the Community Justice Center. Um, and this could even be part of what the community li liaison um, position does. Um, we do know that there is a fee for help for the Community Justice Center's help with specific conflict resolution cases. Um, but we would recommend that you set aside funding um, for these fees on an unneeded basis. And I'm gonna pass it to Emma. Sorry, just trying to find my <laughs> mute button while I'm sharing the screen. Can you still see the presentation? Okay. Um, so as the board knows, um, our district is going to have an incredible opportunity over the next couple of years to make one-time investments as part of the elementary and secondary school emer emergency relief funding, ESSER. One of the focus areas defined by the Agency of Education was social emotional health, mental health, and well-being of our students. This has been the underlying theme of all of our all of the work of this committee and is the foundation for every recommendation that has been made tonight. Ensuring that our students feel safe in their schools is ensuring their social, emotional health, mental health, and well-being. We recommend that the administration and board carefully consider the work of this committee and the re recommendations that we have made when allocating the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. We believe that there are many opportunities to make progress on these recommendations that align with the ESSER funding. So, yeah, wait, can you all hear me now? Yes, a lot better. Okay, awesome. So Susan and I will be presenting this slide um, and I'll just start it. So as a way to keep the broader Montpelier Roxburgh community involved and engaged in this process, the committee plans to take these initial steps to share our work with the broader community. Yeah, so we decided that it would be really important to keep the community informed about our work. And so we thought we were invited to do a district podcast episode. Um, and I, I, 
think probably you're all aware, but they're really fun to listen to. So I highly encourage you if you hadn't had a chance to listen to some of those podcasts. And so we'll share, you know, a lot of the information that's shared in this presentation. We'll share that in a podcast. Um, we're, we plan to have a to have at least one media commentary that um, will run in a local paper, hopefully a couple. We even are hoping to enlist Mary Mello's help. Um, she's done some lovely articles in the bridge. And then we're also um, working on a one pager, a web-based one pager, um, which could also be printed, which just kind of outlines the process we went through um, this year as a committee. Because what we learned is that the community needs information about the work of the board in order to feel invested and to understand and to feel heard. And so we recommend that the board continue this dialogue and outreach to the community. And we, we really want to um, encourage you when it's possible to run a process to solicit community participation in decision making. We found that collecting um, information from all the stakeholders to learn about our community's core values was one of the most important things we did as a group. And so when the board has an opportunity, it, it may make the process take a little bit longer, but not that much longer. Um, we really want you to reach out. The other thing that we think is really important is to utilize the district communications avenues um, when you're doing updates, new policies, or, or just to keep people informed of the work of the board. So uh, we thought we'd start by modeling some of the ways that we're going to try to reach out to the community and it, it might help um, the board as it moves on to to use some of those avenues too. Yeah, I would totally agree. I feel like the real meat of the committee's work was just hearing from the community and realizing the importance of how the, the community needs to, to hear from the district in terms of policy, but the district really needs to hear from the community as well in terms of knowing the experiences of everyone that's directly interacting with the policy um, just to make them as equitable as possible. And yeah, just what, kind of what Mia was saying earlier, just that safety is built on communication. And for me, I feel like that's what my biggest takeaway was being on this committee, just all that transparency and as much as possible. So yeah, this committee was just like a really good model for what that um, interaction can look like because we were kind of a liaison between the broader community and the district so yeah if you ever want to use that again it's a very good idea um so at the end we just wanted to thank you all once again for hearing us out and remind you of our core values that we determine best represent our community um, as we begin and end with them and did last time too. We just thought it was a fitting bookend and thank you for your time. Great, thank you. That was um, absolutely fantastic. Great work. Um, I'm sure the board has a lot of questions. So let's open up the questions and just uh, do the raise hand function. And um, uh, yeah, we can, the committee can kind of choose to, to pick whoever they want to, to answer. So um. for questions, I just want to just, I think, just go around and say, Thank you so, so much for all the investment of your time for listening to the community. I just don't, can't stress enough how grateful I am for all of your work and your heart and your brains and your hands and all of you. So thank you. Andrew. Yeah, I want to I want to second what Amanda said. This is this is so so helpful. Um, really, when we when we put this together, the idea that we would just remove the SRO position for me personally, I just didn't think it was enough. I thought that you know it was almost like, from my perspective, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody when I say this, but from my perspective, it seemed like 
a very reasonable proposal at the outset. I didn't, um, I didn't think it was a heavy lift, but what I did think was a heavy lift was figuring out um, what did we want the, the future of uh, social justice in our schools to look like. And I think you guys have put in place some really, really strong recommendations uh, based on a lot of clearly very powerful community input. And I think there's, there's so much in here that's gonna be so valuable for us in terms of the approach that we take um, for everything from policy making to communicating with the community to figuring out how this factors into uh, future budget decisions. It's just very, very comprehensive and um, you guys did an extraordinary job. So I, I just wanna thank you. Um, the, the one question that I have is the formalized relationship with the Community Justice Center. Are we thinking, I, I know there's a Montpelier Community Justice Center and my understanding is it's part of a larger network that's, a, I think it's under the Department of Corrections if I'm not mistaken. So I was just kind of curious to better understand that particular recommendation. I, that was the one thing I wasn't certain about. So um, we could let Libby start with what, I know that there already is some relationship with the Community Justice Center and the district. So the district uses their services for conflict resolution already. Um, and then there's also, Libby, do you wanna to speak to that piece of it? There's not much more to say to that piece of it. Our, our relationship with them is to, to when there's significant legal offenses that the Community Justice Center works with kids and families to keep them out of jail or keep it off their record. Yeah. From my, from my understanding when I met with them was that we don't have a direct relationship as of June of last year, it was that the police will refer the cases to the restorative justice center. So has that changed since June of last summer? No, we have our SRO was our connection. So right, that's the that's the reason why that recommendation came to light was because the school resource officer was our bridge and was the person primarily responsible for referring cases um, from the district to the Community Justice Center. And in our conversations with the Community Justice Center, we found that, um, you know, in not, not in all cases is it necessary to have a referral from the police that you could work directly with the Community Justice Center. So it's more about just strengthening that relationship and exploring what the future of that relationship could be in the absence of a school resource officer. Um, but I don't want to get into into details because they would only be sort of like the imagination of the committee members and different conversations we've had. I think that would really be up to the administration and the Community Justice Center to decide how that looks moving forward. But they're certainly eager to strengthen the relationship. And I think, um, you know, it seems like the district would be open to that as well. I don't, I, it looks like Amanda that you- Yeah, I was gonna point to, that's what she's trying to, answer i can just add to the fact that we we do invite like the community justice center when we have act 264 meetings um when we're trying to do some wraparound services for students and um they they have been pulled in to help with some truancy in the past it's very rare um but just to let you know that they have been involved but definitely just peripherally in the past and could you elaborate? You you noticed a meeting and you used a buzzword that not all people know. Yeah, it's it's a meeting um, that we pull together for students who are really struggling, and we want to bring together as many resources around the table to brainstorm how best to help those students. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Um, Jill. Thank you. Um, I just, again, wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, that doesn't really seem to cut it, honestly, you know, reading the news and seeing what happens in our country every day, to have the level of depth and thoughtfulness and maturity and um, actionable items that you guys just presented to us. I feel like the United States needs to see this presentation right now. Um, I say that with sincerity and, and, and 
deep gratitude to all of you for all that work. I can only imagine how much work went into that. Um, and I also, like I said, I really appreciate the actionable items. I'm really um, happy to hear about the idea of the community liaison position. I appreciate that there was an acknowledgement that by making the change that we were all talking about, that we were going to be leaving a gap that needed to be addressed in a, in a, in a manner that can still serve the students and families um, and the educators that needed that. So I think that actually sounded like a pretty um, great and actionable item. And I was happy to hear that you had consulted with um, our superintendent about that because that's really helpful um, as far as being part of the bigger picture. Um, I don't know much about the community justice center, so I too would be interested in learning more about that. Um, but yeah, I just um, just really appreciate the depth of your recommendations, the policy recommendations, the actionable items, and the and the um, even proposed solutions for any budgetary concerns there might be. Um, I'm just really honored to have had that moment to uh, watch that presentation, and we're, our community is so indebted to all of you for all that you did all over all these months to provide that information. So thank you very much. Uh, Kristen. Hi, thank you. Yeah, at the risk of being redundant, I just want to um, convey what a massive undertaking that this appears to be. This seems to be the result of work that would maybe span a year or two. And the fact that you all accomplished this in a matter of months and that it's just so comprehensive is um, I'm just incredibly impressed by. Um, and it also seems to reflect just a um, a really important and timely paradigm shift. It sounds like we're just really changing lenses here and the, uh, you know, the kind of the policy review um, that you all have, um, you know, set before us also seems just very comprehensive and it seems you've framed our work very clearly and very strongly. Um, and, um, and I just want to appreciate the presence of the students here and um, commend your commitment to this process and your involvement. And um, I hope it's just been a really um, deeply value adding process, you know, for, for you and, and moving forward and knowing that you are um, so important, you know, to these processes and that your voice um, truly, truly matters. So um, let's see. I want to appreciate um, both Susan and uh, I think it's Eliana or Eliana. I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing, but just uh, I'm new to the board. I'm, I'm, I come from Roxbury and um, am really beginning to understand just my role in terms of community engagement. So hearing that from you all um, just feels important in terms of setting my own rudder and my role as a board member. Um, and then uh, I did want to um, I did want to ask a question about the um, the added role because it also seemed like that would have like a, a budgetary in implication in, in terms of the community liaison. Um, and I don't know how much we can go into it, but just in terms of the the truancy and like what that looks like in terms of trending over time, if we've been seeing more of that like during during COVID times and. Um, you had mentioned that certain kind of data might be looked at and collected um, to see how successful um, that position was able to be in terms of wrapping around those families. And like, I'm sure there are risk factors that contribute to um, truancy and how that would correspond to like the data that would be looked at and collected to see if that was would be successful um, or if that person could be successful. And then, you know, if this was going to be a short term funded position, um, like what then, you know, what kind of is part of that position in terms of seeing that that work could be carried forward to um, support those families. But um, thank you all so much for your work. It's so impressive and I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm going to, oh, I think there was an actual question there though. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to hand it to Libby to answer the question because I have to give full credit to Libby for she was the one that came to Mia and I and said, hey, I think this seems like a perfect fit for the work of the committee. You're about to be making these recommendations and you've been working so hard for so long and it seems like this is a great, uh, you know, great timing. So when the ESSER funds were announced, um, Libby saw that as an opportunity to potentially um, fund a position that would help with the work of the of the committee and what we were about to recommend. Um, but in terms of potential data collection and and that, I'm going to pass that over to Libby. So every year we have some students who just don't want to come to school for whatever reason. Um, 
and it's not all to do with trauma. It's, it's either, usually the big ones are anxiety or trauma. Um, and when a kid doesn't want to come to school, that's like big red flashing lights for, for people like me, because that's what kids should be doing, right? So, um, so that's, we are always very concerned with a kid who, des who decides not to come to school. And, um, and it puts a lot of stress on our system that we have currently. And so the idea with the community liaison position was to add to um, ideally our mental health staff, guidance counselors and social workers, but to have a very small caseload of kids and it would be the kids that really struggle to come to school so that they can be, that person can be the liaison between mental health services, can go pick the kid up if they need a ride, can take them to mental health services, can do all of the things that our current social workers or guidance counselors who are, who are busy <laughs> um, can't do. Um, as far as this year and, tru and truancy, our numbers are no different than they are any other year. Um, we have some students that we can't um, get to engage, and that's but that's typical every year um, right now, so there's no difference. But the idea of data collection on this would be, I mean, ideally, this person would work themselves out of a job. However, I don't think that that's possible um, because we always have new kids and, and trouble comes up and kids need support. And so I think there's always going to be the small caseload of kids. Uh, and so we would take data to see how this support for this family has worked. Um, and this very intensive support has worked and then share with the board and have some, have some drivers as to, or have some goals as to what could be accomplished. And then, you know, I would imagine in three years time that we would come to you to say this, this position met its goals and we need to continue meeting these goals. And so um, we'd like to put in our local budget or not, you know, but that would be a conversation for later on down the road. Yeah. And I'll just say that the committee wanted to leave that opening for the board to consider the position, like potentially the ESSER funding would, it has, it has to be short term, um, you know, over the next couple of years, I believe. And so potentially this is about creating a pilot program that can, and then we can sort of assess assess the efficacy of that program and then continue to fund it potentially. Thank you. Um, Amanda. Um, yeah, uh, in that vein, so questions around what other supports do we need to support students beyond truancy? We always look at truancy as like the it but there are other so many support systems that we can be building so did, is that something that came out um i have three questions so should i give them all at the same time they're different topics so maybe i'll just throw that one in there um and then Libby mentioned something about you know truancy is not just about uh um anxiety it is about anxiety and trauma that not necessarily trauma so what other things can we do to support students that just have anxiety um i just remember of cases where there is bullying and harassment involved in not wanting to come to school um so like yeah what are the broader support systems that we can have beyond the punitive systems that we have around truancy and expulsions and our our own way of framing that kids need to be in school so just um those are questions that is one question that i have and then should i yeah and then i, I have two more so <laughs> okay let's start with the first um i was supposed to take that maybe by libby I think Amanda's posing that to the committee. Right. I'll, jump, I'll jump in, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, because what I think our work showed us is that the community liaison officer, um, the idea of that role was to, to address a lot of the things you talked about, Amanda. And in the, in the slide on the bottom are more details about the, um, the qualifications for that role or, or what the expectations for that role. So I don't think that the committee is at all, you know, um, 
in a position to recommend exactly how to handle that. But I do think we've talked a number of times, we've talked about using positive language and keeping um, the community core values in mind. And um, the things that Mia brought up in addressing policy could also pertain to um, the way that things are handled with that role. So does that answer your question to some extent? Um, I mean, I, um, yeah, and I'm thinking more broadly to what it, outside of that, what other support systems are our students needing? Um, is it after school programs? Is it, you know, that when, think, when we're thinking of safety and we're thinking of being in an inclusive community of love that is reinforcement, reinforcing, you know, uh, programs that can support so that these things don't happen? What are those programs and those support systems? that maybe you uh, were thinking that maybe we're lacking that didn't make it to the recommendations or that were there and I just didn't see it. So is it after school program? Is it, you know, is it more instructors? Is it more? I think what ended up coming up through the committee is that we have pretty good systems in place. It's just about refocusing um, the lens of those systems into you know, using the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy and the six core values to sort of refocus the lens. And so we did we did end up talking a lot about um, and making some recommendations around system wide um, professional development, um, resiliency, trauma informed practices, those types of things, uh, restorative justice. So it's sort of like improving the systems that we have to sort of shift gears towards the recommendations of this of this committee. We didn't get into sort of the granular level of, you know, what are all the potential possibilities? Um, because what we what we felt is we were sort of making like broader recommendations about here, here are the values of the community and here are some very specific things. But in general, we feel like there's work, there's work to be done. So I don't know. Um, you know, I think Libby could probably speak to what is currently in place. And then, you know, it's, I think it's up to us to use our imagination and the district, the board and the district to use our imagination with the recommendations that the committee made of how to improve those current systems. Thanks, Emma. Um, so the, the other question I had around the MOU with the police, um, it seems to me that we still need an MOU with the police uh, my understanding is that there are, it's from from the past conversations in the board, it was that there is still a need for some type of relationship with the police. Um, that in that, you know, outside of not having this, the presence in the school, that there is still a relationship with the school. And the, so it seems, so I am wondering about why the recommendation of just not needing an MOU at all and that just just leaving it out. That's the question that I have. I think I'm going to pass that one to Mia. Do you feel good about that one? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can give it a go. <laughs> I do want to quickly, I, I want to quickly just say, I know that some of the committee members um, were expecting to leave after the presentation. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you, if you have to step away, that's totally fine. If you want to stay to help answer questions, um, you're more than welcome to do that too. But for those of you that need to step off, thank you so much. Yeah, I guess the um, what we came to the realization of is that the what what would benefit the district the most is um, the it, are the standards or expectations or guidelines for when it makes sense to involve the police and that we can handle with our own policies and procedures and that it but it doesn't need to be something that both us and the police department sign that that given the what we engage with the police on now it's more about like us getting our own ducks in a row to say here's where we do need to involve the police and also here's where we don't where maybe you thought you did before or when we had an sro it was a little bit easier to call the sro here are those situations where these are the other ways you would handle that so we would we would lay that out in policy and then procedures on our own end that that was our thinking there 
And also the handbook was a big topic of conversation within the committee. Um, the handbook spends quite a bit of time here and there. I forget, Jen did the math on it, but um, of, about how many times it referenced when and how to um, please become involved. And so those are the those are the areas where we feel we need to focus on is we can write it into policy, into the conflict resolution policy. We can write it into other specific policies, and then we can also write it into the handbook. Um, but that because the formal relationship where we contracted with the police is now over, um, we didn't feel like it was appropriate any longer to have a memorandum of understanding. Thank you. I'm not gonna, I'll save the rest in, in, so to give other people more questions. Uh, Mia. Um, I was actually gonna make a motion um, around the policy recommendations. Um, I feel like this is kind of an easy one, but it does feel like it's it's important to do kind of as we did a few meetings ago with the net zero one, just to like, just ensure that it's in the record that um, I move that we, ask the we direct the, the policy committee to take up the recommendations of the school safety and police relations committee around policy um yeah do i have a second i'll second i would like to uh, process, i would like to process before we do that um because i uh, feel Andrew yeah. had his hand up and Kristen had his hand around questions. And and so like, I, I feel it's a little premature if we don't have the voice of those that really want to ask a question about the presentation. Yeah, so we can probably, you guys agree to table your motion? Sure. Okay. Um, Andrew. Thanks, sorry. <clears throat> I've been eating dinner. I've been in front of a computer since like seven this morning. Um, I was just hoping that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the handbook and the role that the handbook plays. Um, what is the handbook? What, what handbook are we talking about? You know, I, I don't think, um, I think those who have been working on this are pretty close to this document, but I don't think others are quite as familiar, including myself. Um, I can take this again. I don't know if anyone else wants to, if anyone else wants to jump in. But um, so there's the district has a handbook that um, has a section for each school. And it's sort of, it outlines all sorts of things. <laughs> But a lot of uh, a lot of the handbook is sort of spent on a, a nod to some of our policies, bullying, bullying, harassment and hazing, dress code, those types of things are in there. The handbook used to traditionally be printed up and distributed to parents and caregivers. Um, and I don't know when the shift happened um, where it kind of went fully online. I think they might have some copies at the office if you are proactive and go ask for one. Libby can answer that. A few years ago. We can print them up for you. We're <laughs> trying to be environmentally conscious and not print so much paper. Yeah. So they kind of went uh, paper free and now it lives online and you can go to it. And I think, I think the sense that I'm getting is that the community tends to interact with that document more than our board policy page. Um, it's a slightly more user friendly. It's um, written directly to the three different schools. So if your uh, student, sorry, four schools, if your if your student is, you know, having an issue at one of their schools, you can kind of go in and, and read the policy. Um, so there was a few things where the language was sort of a mismatch with the values of that the committee identified. Um, and I think even, you know, Jen, when Jen was going through, 
we, we talked earlier in the presentation about sort of the emphasis on positive language and sort of stepping back from some of that more negative language. And so that, that was something we identified in the handbook as well. Does that answer your question? We could link it. That's, that's oh, it's okay. being linked. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, Etiquette. Thanks, Jim. Um, so my question um, involves about our, our um, is about the the current or the previous, I guess, before um, uh, before we started talking about the the, the change in approach and, and viewing this whole thing from a different lens. Uh, SRO was was performing certain duties, um, and then. I, I see the incredible work that's gone in to, to outline how we're going to move forward and, and uh, the, the, the policy that, you know, the recommendations of, of putting what to put in policies and, and how to approach. And that's, you know, I, I felt that's, that's uh, awesome to, to see all these things. Um, I, I just, I just uh, was wondering uh, that the, the idea is that we, since now the SRO wouldn't be there, we would adopt this different approach and, and we would, you know, whatever the needs of the district that are the kids are, uh, we'll, we'll meet them by following these things. Um, so I'm assuming that committee uh, uh, looked at what duties the SRO was performing, where were the gaps and, and, and you know, got the input from the community and then came up with the recommendations. So I was just wondering, were there any cases or edge cases where some of the stuff is going to be, yeah, SIO is doing that, and then uh, uh, we will continue, the district will continue to utilize the police department to handle those cases. And then clearly the uh, other things uh, that we would uh, achieve by doing restorative justice and, and uh, the community liaison and whatnot. But were there any edge cases where um there was a little bit of confusion whether that should uh fall into the purview of uh police department and or the other um the other approach that we're going to take and I, I was just wondering whether there's any confusion about i don't know where this would fall there's no clear definition of what we would do what we should do in this particular situation So we did spend quite a bit of time, especially in the first part of our charge, um, sort of analyzing the role of the current, the current use of the SRO. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the whole committee because we didn't, we didn't like do it the way that you discussed where like we took all of the job functions and then we like made sure that they're going to still be able to be covered. Um, we did sort of do like a higher level there were a couple of things that rose to the surface as areas of concern. And the first um, thing that rose to the surface was home visits and, and truancy. So I think the community liaison position will help with that like highest level of concern. Um, and, you know, I, I think ultimately it didn't feel like the purview of this committee to get into that level of detail of you know, here's when, you know, when this happens, this is what's going to happen. When this happens, then this is going to happen. If there's vandalism, then you will call the police. If there's a break in, then you will call the police. If there's drugs, then you won't call the police. You know, we didn't get into that level of detail around when um, Libby or other administrators will be able to, you know, utilize the police force and, and not. Um, I think that we're making more of a value statement here around what we want to see moving forward. And we've eliminated, the board has eliminated the SRO position. And now we're putting it into the hands of the administration and the board to get into that level of detail. You know, so if you want, if the board wants to write policy that would be more explicit about when and when not to be, for the administrators to be allowed to um, involve police, then that would be up to the board. 
Um, and then I'm sure I know that Libby has already been working hard with the Montpelier Police Department to establish what the relationship between the district and the police department looks like moving forward in the absence of the SRO. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Uh, so, so the, the policies, some of the, some of these would, re would be addressed by the policy, but the uh, bulk of it would be um, on administration to, to kind of come up with the approach of what, what, um, whose services to utilize, right? Yeah, I mean, does, does anyone else want to contribute to the answer to this? I'm trying to, okay, Will? Sure. Um, um, I just want to mention that um, some of our recommendations um, are not just designed to address the, the now absence of the SRO, um, but also you mentioned um, in your question, um, I think you called them edge cases or um, situations where it wasn't necessarily clear um, whether or not the SRO should be involved, whether or not the police should be involved, what the procedures or outcomes would be. Um, and that lack of clarity um, is not new to now the absence of the position, something we noticed a great deal of in, in the many different kinds of anecdotes that we learned from the community. Um, there was, for whatever reason, a lack of consistency um, and transparency in terms of who would be involved when um, and would, would what agencies, would the criminal justice, would the community justice center be involved um, there was not a lot of consistency or transparency um, between the schools and even within the schools. Um, and so part of our recommendation that this, um, that policies should be consistently applied and there should be a clear threshold of when the police would be involved and when not. Um, that would be, that doesn't just address um, the new situation of a post SRO district. Um, it also addresses um, some of the problems we saw in anecdotes of years past. Amanda? Um, yeah, so I, so I, I'm just, I, I, I think for the board, the, like for me in the board, the MOU is still a very important conversation to have um, and and the relationship with the police and how that goes because I um, you know I just like see that this description still leaves a lot of holes for me as to this relationship which brings me back to last year where it's like we don't know when even if we create policies there's still this ample open space for this for not having clear rules on, or, or clear guidelines of when and, and, and is now. Um, and also that relationship with the community justice center and like how that, that isn't. So I, so, so I, so for me, it's clear that it's a conversation I would like to continue to have as the board. And I appreciate all the feedback. Is the police department interested in having an MOU with us? Because an MOU takes two parties. Mia? Yeah? I could I can speak to that. Jay Erickson isn't here. He wasn't able to make it tonight because there's a city council meeting. He was our um, rep from the city council on the committee and he had a couple of conversations with Chief Pete. Um, I don't know that he would necessarily characterize it as not interested, but he did say that Chief Pete's feedback was that it seemed unnecessary. So I, I, I mean, it seems like the door would still be open, but that was the position that he reported back from his conversations with Chief Pete. Yeah, and I think it's also worth mentioning that that um, the board does not enter into MOUs, uh, the administration does. So um, if the district were to have an MOU with the police, it wouldn't be a direct MOU with the board. Um, 
other we also did we also did float the idea of having a police relations policy but in the end we landed on a conflict resolution policy and we felt that within the conflict resolution policy and the procedure that that police relations um piece could be covered and, and to some degree the you know i mean we're essentially citizens of of the city of montpelier so um you know there, there are certain jurisdictions that the police are going to have whether we we want it or not um so uh, i think we need to be mindful that that the police the police are, are in some instances going to be the deciders of when, when the police get involved. Andrew. Yeah, so <clears throat> this kind of ties into what Mio was, um, the action Mio was proposing before. And I'm not, my memory is a little foggy of exactly what Mia was proposing. So Mia, um, you're definitely gonna have to propose this again, but from from my perspective in terms of so i haven't seen this policy recommendations document until you just mentioned these recommendations i was like oh did i miss something and i i gathered the 5000 foot i heard the 5000 foot uh message and really appreciated what i heard but i have literally not taken a look at this document until now and i did not have we received this um this presentation this morning I did not have an opportunity all day to see this presentation. So I, I, I just, for the first time, I'm taking this all in, really appreciate it, very positive. I have very positive response to it, really appreciate the work, but I just see, you know, what Emma, you just mentioned that this conflict resolution policy, this is where the vision for the district's relationship with the police department could live. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, my general thought is whatever whatever kind of action we take, if we, um, you know, refer this these recommendations to the policy committee, all all for the policy committee taking this up and considering it. But I just want to put it out there in terms of taking any formal action tonight. Um, there, there there's a lot of substance here, and I think that's wonderful. But I, as an individual board member, would like at least until the next board meeting to review that substance and understand that substance substance before taking any kind of action other than like referring it to a committee uh, that would take action on it. I just don't feel comfortable having not, I haven't read this, these recommendations taking any super formal action on them right now. So I just wanted to put that out there. Also, yeah, that have, oh, go ahead. That makes sense, Andrew. And I, I was just um, gonna say that the 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 motion that I made was very top level to refer these recommendations, direct the policy committee to take up these recommendations, essentially to review them, and it's in the policy committee's hands to decide what to do with them. Take you know, take the recommendations, apply them, do the research to update the policies in any such way that either follow the recommendations or don't. Yeah, it's a, it was a very top level motion that 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 I made. I, I appreciate that. I can totally support that. I just wanted those in attendance to understand where I am. And I have I imagine I don't know that a number of other board members probably haven't really uh, gotten into the substance of this as deeply as we might over the course of the next several weeks reviewing these materials, because there's a lot here. and. Clearly a lot of great work went into this. So thank you again. Yeah, and I also want to just add, and, and I think, you know, having having the, the policy committee delve deeper into these recommendations is a great next step. Um, a lot of these policies are heavily, heavily um, both structured around and constrained by state and federal law. Um, you know, for instance, the hazing, harassing, bullying, bullying policy is very strongly governed by state and federal law. Um, and there are things that have to be in there and things that cannot be in there. Um, you know, our, our policy on firearms, which is three quarters of a page, uh, is governed by four federal laws and two state laws. So, um, so we're going to have to, this, this work on some of these policies is going to have to be done um, 
probably with the district lawyer and our hands may be tied to a, a pretty um, pretty high degree on, on, on probably a handful of these ones. Amanda, did you have another question? I, ha I have a recommendation. And, and uh, I, I just, uh, again, want to just thank you all for all of your work. I know it's late. I want to, because I, I know how much work you did, I do want to make sure that we all at the board really spend some time reading it before it goes to any any committee. So, um, and I think that, so like what I want to suggest is that I, I would like to propose that in order to honor the work of the committee, that we will, that the board receives these recommendations that we will table them for the next board meeting where we can have as a board a full discussion of what we see and then but commit to this committee that we will in a quarterly basis at least really report back to you what our pro and to the community what our progress is and what we're doing. Um, I, I just I want to honor your work and I want to make sure it doesn't sit on the side and that our time constraints and the multiple um, loves that we have for many topics in our district that are not countered. So like, I would like to make some sort of motion that we're taking this recommendation saying that in a quarterly basis, we will give an update report on what we're doing to uphold the recommendations of the of the, of the board. And, that, and now I just left the motion and just say that, then we will read all of it very intently for the next board meeting when we have a full discussion as to what's coming up for each of the individual school board members. I don't know what I said, but it's all what I meant to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think you basically said that we should <laughs> absorb this and and um, talk about it at the at the next meeting, which I think is our retreat. So it might have to be the meeting after that. I also think it might be worth. Um, and I'll have to talk to, to Olivia about how to do this cheaply. Um, getting our district attorneys involved so they can help us at the onset, kind of with some of these policies, saying, you know, for instance, you know, this is a policy you have discretion with, this is a policy you don't, here are some areas you could you could add values to, you can't go here because I think that might save us a lot of work of putting some really good ideas that we'd love to see that we may or may not be able to do. Because um, again, I think some of the, the core policies to this, um, some are very heavy, have very heavily regulated. And I know that, um, you know, again, I mean, hazing, harassment, and bullying comes up as a, a prime example of a policy that probably if, if the committee could sit down and, and make additions to and, and change, um, probably one of the things that a lot of people had in mind but it, it might be one of those things where um, we might we might have, have narrow room to operate. So I think getting a sense of that would be helpful. And there might be some some policies where we have more room than we can do. Amanda. You know, lawyers, right? Like I don't think we, we go to the lawyers the first time. We go to the lawyers the third step, like because lawyers are lawyers. Lawyers are always going to tell you no. I'm married to a lawyer. I work for a lawyer. So, and as an organizer, what I have learned is that you do your natural organic thing first so that your brain can flow. You don't have to do all the work before you get to the lawyer because I think that it does impede some of the work. Um, and, and I think that we can learn from other districts that are looking similarly at some of these policies that have, are in these recommendations that are, that, you know, so I think that we don't have to be here, right here in this box. I think, I think this is an opportunity of growth. This is an opportunity of dreaming and being able to really put our hearts and brains into what's good for our kids. And so I think that, um, putting already like a tap on what we can and cannot do really limits uh, the beauty of what this work is giving us. So I think that, um, again, like I think it's, it's important to not be like, 
here, like we might not be able to do all of this after you work all these months. And I know that's not what you're trying to say, but I just want to be more positive that yes, there are possibilities and that we, and that we should be able to strive for those possibilities. Um, and, and like to really dream of what our school district can be in terms of safety, because this is what this work is all about. So again, like I just move that we table this for next school board meeting and I want us to commit just like we committed to the the student group that came a month ago that we commit to this group that we will make sure that we are taking these recommendations that we will give an update you know on a quarterly basis of how our district is doing moving towards the recommendations and the work that you see we honor all your work um and so that's that's what I Yeah, no, duly noted, and I know lawyers definitely can get, get in the way, and I wasn't suggesting we put a cap on our creativity, but um, but knowing knowing where to direct it can also be helpful. Uh, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks both, Jim and Amanda. I, I just want to add to that, um, that discourse just briefly, which is it, it is true that there might be some things that we might not be able to to do or certain policies that might need to be worded a certain way to be consistent with state and federal law. But I also see, and I, you know, just have just through listening and just briefly scanning this um, after Mia's like, after Mia's proposal before I was like, oh my God, I should brush up on this before voting. Um, is I do think that there will be a lot in here that we can do. And I think that there's a lot yeah, here that we can work with. And I think that there, this this serves as an asset for the policy committee. And there's also some really important recommendations that you've made with regard to how we conduct our business that I also think are super valuable. So um, I think I, I I think this serves as just a monumental benefit to us. And I I do think there is a lot that we can do with this. So. Um, Thank, thank you again. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, Emma. Yeah, I'm I'm totally fine with, with tabling and maybe there, you know, I was wondering at the outset of this, I wasn't sure if there was a motion to be had tonight. You know, I think that the work of the committee was was really authentic and deep and beautiful. And it started way back in May when the Just Schools Initiatives folks and others came to the board and vocalized um, a mismatch of community values with the practices of our district. And, you know, it was an opportunity for us to look inward as a board and as a district. And we've done that. And, you know, I, I see the recommendations of the committee tonight as a starting point and a call to action of, you know, a refocusing on what are our community values and how do we want to um, create a vision, like Amanda said, a, let's dream here. Let's dream together about what the future of the district could look like, what the future of safety and conflict, conflict resolution and justice uh, and discipline, you know, could look like to be more in line with the values of this community. And so I see this as a starting point. And, um, you know, the, the conversations that we've had as a committee since October, they were sometimes a little emotional and sometimes a little political and sometimes we disagreed. But ultimately, at the, at the end of the process, I think that we've um, laid out some, some pretty important values that if you look at, if you look at our best practices, through those lens, our best practices of, of justice and conflict resolution and restorative practices in the district, through the lens of those values, I think you'll see there's a lot of work to be done. You know, and something that uh, came up when Libby reported out on the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy months ago, um, that I felt that sat with me and felt poignant at the time and still does resonate is um, is that the work is never done. You know, it's like, this is a, a continuum. We're not gonna rubber stamp something and make a motion tonight and then be finished. You know, we have a lot of work ahead of us and it may never end because we're lifelong learners and we want to continually improve. So um, 
I, I will respect any decision to table <laughs> and and sit with the information and think about how it might um, affect different aspects of all of our various best practices, both at the board and district level. Great, thanks, Emma, very well put. Um, so it sounds like we want to absorb this great work uh, and um, I think put it on the agenda for our next regular board meeting, uh, which is May 4th. It's the 5th, Jim, May 5th. May 5th, okay. Um, and, and then kind of see where we're at. Um, but you've given us, again, this is incredible work. Uh, super thankful, very, very important work. Um, I, I really uh, am pretty blown away by it, both the time investment and um, uh, I think the ability to, to, uh, to reach out to the community. And actually that's one thing that, that I'd love to hear more about uh, from producers and the board members as well, but also from all of you, just um, you know, the measures you employed to, to really get community input and what the board can do uh, to, to do that on a more regular basis. Um, and, um, and just the, the thoughtfulness and, and the thinking outside the box, um, you know, and by getting the lawyers involved, that did not, did not need to put a damper on it, but, um, I think part of, you know, part of our job is going to be finding where, where, where we can, can best incorporate these, um, and, uh, where we, uh, you know, where we're, we're otherwise constrained so we can best focus our, our efforts and, and turn these, these ideas into, uh, into, implement, into implementable um, actions. Uh, so any other, any other thoughts or comments before we uh, turn to uh, policy monitoring? Excellent, well, thank you everyone. We really, really appreciate uh, your hard, hard work. Uh, this is uh, definitely one of the most work intensive and I think dedicated committees I've, I've seen um, in my several years on the board. So uh, I really appreciate the, the work you've done and the, the opportunity you've given to the district to step forward on, on these issues. So thank you. Um, policy monitoring, uh, we've got two up, D12, prevention of employee harassment. Hey, hey, Jim. Yep. I, I see on the agenda there's also the climate survey and retreat planning. Oh, yes, you're right. Um, okay, thank you for noticing that. Uh, um, okay, so let's do uh, climate survey and Libby, do you want to give the background? I know this, I know this is something we have that is part of our, our contract. I think the last time we did it was two years ago. Um, yeah, it's part, it's part of the contract um, that the board is to give a, a climate survey each year. I can remember two, two years ago and I don't mean to sell, sell the board out in any way, but I was give, <laughs> I was asked to find a climate survey rather late in the game and I sent one out um, to educators like in the last week of school and just had to find one. Um, the survey that you see right now is not mine. I did not create it in any way, shape or form. It's from PVIS um, and, and did the trick for that year. <laughs> um, but we don't have one set. The board does not have a climate, so climate survey set that is sent home every, or sent to, sorry, staff every year. Uh, Jill. Thank you. I, I just keep thinking about how strange a time we're still sort of in and maybe starting to get out of and, and where we're at with the school year and, and COVID. And uh, as a state employee, you know, we just took a climate survey and, and it's fascinating results about some of the positives in our case. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how how you design a climate survey that is useful beyond just sort of measuring or capturing any um, 
lessons learned from this past year because it's just been such a, a unique year. I just don't know. I don't, you know, I think it, 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 I don't think asking the same sort of climate, you know, how's your work life balance kind of stuff. Um, but I think it would be fascinating as like a data geek. I actually really do want to hear. And I think it is really interesting from the students and the staff perspective. I'd love to do some sort of a, you know, how'd this year go? Um, and, and how can we, are there any lessons that we've learned? It's just, this is not a normal year to take a climate survey in a way that could be measurable against a past climate survey, for example. So I'm not really offering any helpful thoughts other than, um, you know, it might have to be a different kind of a, a climate survey this year. Uh, Mia. Um, yeah, I was thinking we had, I think it was the last meeting we were in, we were talking about using the climate survey as a, um, to gather information that we might be able to use in the retreat. Um, so I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying, Jill, and I wonder if because one of our objectives at the retreat is to be setting goals as a, for us as the board, that information actually for where teachers are at right now would really help inform goals that we'd want to be thinking about and maybe setting for the, the board and how we can be supporting our educators for the coming year. Um, so I, I am excited about, I was glad to see this on the agenda for today and I'm excited about the idea of getting this out in time to get the data back for, um, for the, the retreat happening in May. Um, and then I think, I mean, I think one of the purposes for it to be a dis up for discussion is um, I brought some ideas for things that we could add into the survey. Um, so I just wanted to toss them out there for consideration and I don't know, I feel like it might be hard. Oh, anyway, I'll say them out loud, but it might be hard to kind of keep track of them. So I don't know how to like get it written down so people can look at them to absorb them and think about them. Maybe I can email everybody on the board or something. But um, the one is that I know Libby, you've mentioned that it's been challenging to um, figure out how to collect demographic data, but I wonder if maybe within a broader survey, um, if including even if they were optional questions around identity and demographics um if this is the 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 container within which we could do that um i saw from our from ues actually going home or going to students will be a climate survey for students which i wholeheartedly support and i saw that there were demographic questions in there so it felt like mirroring that with the climate survey to teachers seemed um like it, um totally almost necessary to do so that we can can see where people are at um, in, you know, potentially based on um, their identities and how that impacts the, the, the climate for them in, within the school. So that was one thing I wanted to offer to add. Um, the second or the, the next are just a few other questions I think we could include that would be um, also very useful around some of the some of the things we've just learned from the committee. Um, one being um, asking teachers to rate, you know, how they feel they're able to collaborate with other teachers and other staff at their schools. Like what's the collaborative environment getting beyond like feeling the, how they fit in, but what's the collaborative environment? Um, are they able to contribute to determining the um, continuous improvement plan um, and annual school goals? Like do teachers and other staff have a role to play in that. Um, the uh, and then how do other decisions throughout the year relate to the continuous improvement plan? Um, and um, and then uh, any questions around? I had a couple ideas of questions around how teachers um, experience the school and and community engagement, um, and also uh, feedback from the teachers around how restorative practices are are used. Um, so. I know that's not the best way to absorb all that information, but this is also kind of my jam. So I had, I was put a, uh, some thinking into what else we could include in this survey um, before coming into the meeting. No, good suggestions. Um, Amanda. Yeah, I echo me as, and I know that um, with UES there, this is the second year that there will be a climate survey for families, um, which the site council just edited uh, a few days ago. Um, and, and this is the second year, so a kind of like a continuation. 
And I and I so I think that it's echoing those questions, but also kind of focusing to on different practices that maybe work this year that were new due to the pandemic um, that people really love that what they would you know that they, like what are the things that worked this year that weren't present before because of like so basically redoing this and like adding some of the COVID specific questions um and and like changes and how they like they felt we know that everybody felt really supported by libby and like the the principles and whatnot but like really go deep uh to around i know there were some you know instructional changes that happened co-instructors in some classes that were um so all of that that you know maybe some things that will tell us more when we're thinking of yeah and so um i i do also wonder if an optional demographic piece, just like we are doing uh, with the other climate surveys for families, uh, will work, and and it could be just a section. Um, and and so I guess, I guess we have the potential to be able to draft our own survey and just take some of those P, you know, PBIS questions, but really have an opportunity to create our own since the board was unable to create it last year. And Mia is their jam, and it's my jam. Maybe we can do it and like send it out. <laughs> but put, put together an updated survey. I'd like to do that. I think if you two want to take take it on, that would be fantastic. Um, the union has been quite clear to not ask those demographic questions. I'm just going to put that out there. It doesn't matter if you ask it or if I ask it. The union has been quite clear about that. Um, so the board would risk uh, whatever kind of grievance would come to you um, around that. We talked again yesterday at the equity team meeting about how we could get that information. And we have some questions going out to our licensing people and to try to get it that way, because that's where I have a hunch that information is housed at the Agency of Education. So we're hoping to get that information in other ways, but the union has been quite clear about not asking those questions. So just want to put that out there. It's your survey and you can try to ask those questions, but um, they've been very clear about that. I, if, if. Well, well I just wanted to note that Emma does have her hand up. I may, it's probably, oh, maybe it's about something yeah. other than this, but. Oh, I didn't. It's a different topic, so let's stay oh, on this topic. Yeah, it's, then... it's about this. My my general thought is having uh, negotiated with the teachers union for the past three years, um, when Libby has advised me not to do certain things and I've done them, it has not turned out well. And um, what I think, if, if, first of all, I think we should see if this avenue she's exploring would work. Um, you know, and the fact that our, I, I, I wrote a chairlift with the president of our local teachers union recently, and she was very thankful for the board and the support of the board over the course of the past year. And if this is something that the union has articulated to Libby, they really are not interested in right now. I feel like this, taking this approach would be pretty disrespectful. Um, what I do think we could potentially do if what Libby's looking into doesn't work is we could have some kind of negotiation with them about this, a discussion rather about this to better understand the situation rather than, you know, just putting it out there. Um, it, and then it's not, it, you know, Libby, you can tell me what you think, you know, I don't want us to be stepping on your toes, but, um, if it's if the request really is coming from the board, so I almost wonder if we should, at some point, maybe have a meeting with some of their folks to discuss um, why we're interested in this information and how we think it can help uh, their membership as well. It could it could be a simple letter. Um, I mean, I I work with the NEA very closely, and this is something that they're very passionate about. So I know we have like three unions, so there might be a different union that we're talking about. But like, I know I know that um, diversifying the T 
teacher workforce is something that is really important for them too. Um, so yeah, like a letter to the union said, this is why, like we're just asking for a conversation and this is why it's, an, this is why we're seeking this information and so and part of the vision of the board, it will be just nice to know why. That sounds like yeah, a good, oh, sorry, Mia. I was just gonna say that's helpful context, Andrew. I appreciate that. And, and Libby, I also appreciate you getting creative about mm -hmm. figuring out, being able to get a, at least a baseline understanding of what the demographics are um, within our workforce. Um, and it feels like if it is, if we don't have these questions inserted in this survey, then we are missing an opportunity to see like, how does someone who holds a different identity than I have experience the climate within the school um, that so if we if what Libby if what you're pursuing does work then yes we'll get that baseline understanding but it won't be linked up with the answers within this survey which to me feels like a missed opportunity but I I also understand the you know, certainly as a new board member that there's a lot that I don't know about the dynamic between um, the union and the district and the union and the administration. And I also can see the, you know, the great work that you have done to build up that relationship. And so hearing that feedback from Andrew is very helpful. And it makes me think like if there was some way for us to, again, not step on your toes, but to work, to try and get an understanding of where they're coming from and also help them see where, what we're trying to do by asking this information, I, I would, I would, really appreciate that opportunity um, just because it really feels like a missed opportunity to not have be able to see what how any one person is experiencing the climate within the schools which we know just in general it does you know our identities do shape that so I just want to be clear it's not me who's telling you not to do this it's the union who's telling you not to do this I, yeah. I, well. I didn't, I I, I, I want that. to get this information. We're working to get this information, but it's not me who's not who's not wanting this information. Um, and I'd also rely on our policies to understand the communication structure between board and teachers directly, and when that's appropriate and when it is not. I would just make sure that you rely on your policies to do that. Yeah, so it sounds like we should approach this delicately and make sure that we are. Um, it sounds like looking at our policies in terms of how we engage the union and trying to make an ask within those policies makes a lot of sense if someone wants to, to figure that out. Um, and I don't know whether that's a, a simple letter or a meeting or, or what, but it does seem to make sense to try to find a way to communicate. I love that Don just turned on his camera. I was waiting for you, Don. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, is, is it okay? I just have uh, one thing to say is I'm, I'm here actually on behalf of the union. I'm the vice president of the union and I'm uh, just listening in. And one of the things that I would say a lot to, has come up tonight and about the survey, and if you could uh, put it into a paragraph exactly what you're hoping for or asking for. And then you emailed that to me. I'd be happy to uh, send out some feelers to folks and see if we can't get a group of people who would you know, be willing to address this uh, question and have that discussion. So that to me would be very helpful, just a really clear statement of purpose. And then I'd be happy to deliver that in my capacity and, and talk to folks about this. Uh, we're having discussions on lots of different things, and this could be another one where we um, see if we can come up with a solution that satisfies uh, both parties. Thank you, Don. That was super helpful. Um, Appreciate that. Thank you. I'd be willing to write back. Yeah, that'd be great. And just uh, Libby, it's my email is just dont at mpsvt.org. And if you can get that to me, uh, as soon as possible, I'll get to work on that. Yeah, and, and Amada, can you make sure you coordinate with um, probably Andrew or Jill or someone from the negotiations committee on that email, just so 
they can make sure it's kind of consistently task correspondent. And, yeah. and just to be fair too, um, it sounds like Libby has gotten a clear message and I'll just poke around and see exactly why that message has been so clear and where that's originated and, and kind of do some homework on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you very much. Um, Emma, you've had your hand up for a while. So this is a shifting of gears, but um, I, I like the like art scales that are being used because it helps like quick, a quick analysis of data once the survey results start coming in. I was wondering if we might want to add like a neutral answer in the Likert scale that um, is offered. There's four options. And I was wondering if we wanted to um, potentially include a fifth option that was like more neutral and not, you know, neither agree or disagree. Um, and I also thought it could be interesting to offer a couple of open-ended questions towards the end. Um, maybe something like, you know, one, if you could do one thing to improve school climate, what would it be? Or, you know, um, something like that. Is there, is there one current practice that you believe contributes positively to school climate? What would it be? Some, you know, just to generate some more open-ended uh, qualitative answers. If I could make a suggestion, I might suggest that the members of the teacher negotiation team, who are the board members who have the authority to work directly with the teachers through their negotiations committee stance, get in touch with the negotiations team of the teachers to ask them exactly what, this was a teacher asking to the contract is my understanding, to ask them directly what, what kind of climates or what was the intent to this part of the contract and what we're, we're, we're all as a district looking to gather from this because the teachers look for it too, since I got feedback from the last survey. Um, so I would, I, if I could, I would recommend to the board that the board members who have a direct link to the teachers already through the negotiations process, and since this is contractual, um, open up that line of communication. I hesitate to have uh, the board in general interacting with the teachers in general, because that's breaking a lot of policies. So I, I would recommend going through the negotiations committee here. I'm, I'm happy to reach out to to Chris um, on this Emma if you want to if you want to send me any any follow-up emails on this I'm happy to do that so just like suggestions of added questions email those to you well I think I think the the question well I I think I think the five thousand foot level question that I just heard was, you know, what it, what it, what would be helpful for the. Do you want to repeat what you just said again? I want to make sure that I didn't misunderstand you. Well, so, like maybe two open-ended questions to get at sort of their dream come true addition to the school climate. You know, if there was something that we could do to improve school climate, what would it be? Um, and then if there's something that they feel needs to be improved as, when it comes to, you know, like sort of getting at both angles. Like, what do you think we're doing well in terms of school climate? And what do you think could be improved in terms of school climate? I don't know exactly how to word it. And I think Libby's suggestion is a good one, which is involving the teachers in this process and doing it through the negotiations um team since it is a in the contract and what i heard from you libby is reaching out and i would reach out to chris because he's he's the point he's been the point on this for the past number of years is um you know what what did they have in mind what what would they view as as being helpful um through the survey what types of questions and and was this so I'm sorry, I don't really understand. It says at the top of the survey that the survey was created by PBIS. Was so did the did our our teachers union provided this survey as what they would like to use? Oh, no. okay. I didn't inherit a survey that had been used in the past. Don's been here more than I have. So Don, you may be able to shed some light on this that I can't. 
but I didn't inherit a survey. So, okay. um, so that was just one, it had to be done quickly. And so I just found one <laughs> that, okay. that I got that from. I'm not connected to it in any way, shape or form. Okay. And contractually, when it, it you're contractually, we are contractually obligated to conduct a climate survey okay. annually. Yes. And, um, but there's no further sort of um, details about what the survey needs to have in it. Right, right. However, I, I know because I got feedback about that survey the last time that there are the, there is an intent behind it that, that the teachers union wants to know a lot of information too and they want to know very specific information. So Don, I don't want to ask you to talk. I'm trying very hard not to ask you to talk on behalf of the union, but. <laughs> uh, no, I, we've actually discussed this in, in recent meetings, the climate survey, and there's been a discussion about uh, where the survey comes from, because there are lots of surveys already out there. And uh, I think what Andrew said about uh, contacting the negotiations team, both Chris and Joe Carroll, uh, who are very knowledgeable about this. And I'm just wondering also, again, this is something I don't want to speak for the association without doing some homework on this, but it seems it sounds like a co-created survey that includes both information from, you know, what the board wants to find out and what teachers need uh, would serve in our best interest. And it sounds like a co-created survey or at least an instrument that we could all agree with um, would make things a lot more palatable when those, you know, when those results come back. And I would highly suggest that, um, you know, that that goes out to our negotiations team. I, that idea sounded very good uh, to go through the negotiations team because they're the ones who uh, have that familiarity. Um, and I would also say that if this happens, you know, within the next two weeks, I think that would be awesome. Uh, we have our next executive board meeting is May 11th. And then we also have a full membership meeting tentatively scheduled for May 13th. And so, um, you know, just begin at least beginning this process, if not finding that tool would be very helpful. Um, it sounds like for everyone involved. Really, really appreciate it, Don. This has been a very confusing 10 minutes. So I just want a clarification. Uh, there is a concern that we as teachers that Libby has, right? Like you want to make sure that we're in our lane. So I, and, and that we are not falling over our policies. Then there, so the, the paragraph that I was going to send on is better if Chris, if Andrew sends it so that we limit our relationship with the union, like all of the other board members. So just trying to clarify in my head. And then, um, and that the survey that me and I were gonna work on will now be done by Andrew and who else is Gary with the teachers committed so that we are all in our lanes. I, I, I think what it just comes down to Amanda is, you know, we, we um, work together to establish a legal framework and contractual framework um, that our our teachers operate within and we deal with uh that and, and the union is is a very formalized structure as well and they have um designees who work with us on these types of issues and we have good relationships with those individuals and and um what don what i interpreted don suggesting is you and libby suggesting is hey you've got an avenue to work on this, um, use that existing structure. So um, if you and uh, Mia want to put together a paragraph and send it to me uh, in the next day or so, I can reach out to um, Chris and Joe who represent the union in negotiations um, and include that as a piece of the request for input from them and they'll work with uh, their union representatives and, and Don um, to figure out, you know, what what message they want to send us on this, what they're okay with, what they're not okay with. You know, I don't know exactly what their 
um, deliberations look like, um, but I, I know that they're generally very well considered. So, Don, do you want to add anything to that? No, and Amanda, what I would be doing is just uh, after this meeting, I'll just be notifying, you know, the folks on the board. That's what I'm here to do is to notify them that there's going to be um, a communication from the board to our negotiations committee regarding the climate survey and that that's something that uh, the negotiations team will bring to the executive board so we can get that ball rolling. Thank you so much, John. I, I really appreciate it. And as a new board member that has never been in negotiations or understand the relationships with the union, this is very enlightening and helpful for me to like move forward and like how we work in our district. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And sorry for jumping in, Kristen. No, it's okay. Uh, I just had a question about the, the timeline. Um, I see that this is like an annual, it sounds like contractual requirement. And it also sounds like it, this, this might need some more time in terms of arriving at something that feels both comprehensive and collaborative so that we could kind of take the opportunity to work, you know, with the union and so that everybody's kind of getting the information that would be, you know, so that it's just optimized. So is there a timeline that can allow for sort of an optimal kind of survey creation process? Or is this something that I think I heard that it wanted to be done possibly before a retreat and or if it has to be annual is there like an actual deadline for us to get this done it's in the contract that it has to be done yearly yeah it has not been done yet i i think it's a great idea to get a survey together that we can use you could use yearly you know so that you can compare it between years and it's not just finding something off the internet but it's something that everybody really values and gets information off of um so i was just curious is yeah uh, yeah yeah because we're gonna get a you next <laughs> thanks uh, i was just curious uh, it sounds like the one action little item from the contract is to get the survey out um is there any other action item for the board um what to do with the survey um act on it it's just basically just have a survey and the results um are they sent out obviously the administration collects them the board gets to look at the survey uh, survey results anybody else like the do they go back to the union i think i can't remember from two years ago it seems like it was about 15 years ago at this point but um, I, I know that we talked, the board talked about the survey results in the retreat. That was part of the data collection yeah. that I shared. Um, and we had a good long conversation about it there. And I'm pretty positive I sent it out to the, the union as well. But I could be right. It, it seems so long ago. Yeah, <laughs> I was just trying I to understand <laughs> the, the intent behind this. I mean, if the union wanted us to have that survey out, wondering if they wanted the results or their internal analysis or whatever. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the union will use the results, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I do think we have, we did share it with the union. Um, are, Mia, Amanda, are those old hands or, or new hands? Old hands? Uh, so- No, no mine's, sounds... mine's mostly new. Mine's, okay. <laughs> mine's mostly new. I just wanted to go like a little bit further on the clarification because that, that um, Amanda was, Speaking, I that that was very helpful for me as well. But I just wanted to say out loud what I think is happening next is that um, it's essentially an um, a we're opening up the process to co-create a survey together with the with a team from the from the union, and that it'll be our negotiations team, our teachers negotiations team that will hold that process. Yeah, and so any any ideas we have or whatever should go to the board negotiations team ideas yeah, so, requests whatever yeah so the the communications will be through the negotiations team um which is jerry andrew and jill yeah but we we would have to have a public meeting um and this can really this what i'm thinking so here's what i'm thinking what I'm thinking is Mia and Amanda, since this is your jam, I think you guys should step up and draft uh, a, a survey that you think would be really good, 
good. It's not a quorum of our board. It's not a quorum of a committee. I think you two can work on that. Before you get started on that, though, if you can send me a statement, Amanda, that you were talking about on the demographics piece, um, you know, why, why, uh, what we're seeking to collect, why it would be helpful, how we think it can be beneficial to both uh, teachers, the board, the administration, I think that would be really helpful. And I think if you could send that tomorrow, that would be ideal. And then I'll aim to engage Chris and Joe, then we don't need to have a, a public meeting because I'm just acting um, as an individual board member. And I, I've done this with, with Chris before to sign the, the contract, I can engage with Chris and Joe and say, hey, you know, we'd love input from you guys, explain that you two, Mia and Amanda are working on this and the board will be involved um, and also raise the demographics uh, issue with them as well. Does that sound like? Yeah, I just, I just want to put a clarification. I just want to make sure that, um, yeah, yeah, even though me and Amanda are working to kind of put this together, that the the communication gets funneled through the negotiations. Um, yeah. And that it's clear that the channel of communication with the union is through the negotiations committee. Um, so we're not in a situation where we've got, you know, multiple board members reaching out to the union and, you know, kind of confused about these. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And then I'm, it's, a, you know, it's nice to hear that the union is also already thinking about this. It feels like we're all, we're all starting with a good jumping off point. Um, it does sound to me like going through this process might mean that we don't have the um, data from the survey in time for the board retreat, just because it, you know, I, I imagine a few iterations of the survey and then the time to fill it out. But I, so I'm just putting that out there as, we might just have to be okay with that. I, maybe we, we should share it, for it, it, but we also share it at a different different board meeting. It doesn't have to be out there. Sure. Yeah. We could have a different board meeting. Out. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah. The idea was to help us frame our our board retreat, like thinking big picture. So, but yeah, if we can get it by the board retreat, that might be good. But remember, we've got the board retreat. I think the first meeting is going to be the fifth or sixth. Uh, we've got spring break coming up. It's already mid-April. Um, yeah, might 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 be a, a, a tight dam. Um, all right. Anything anything more on this? I think we've got got a plan. Okay. Brings us to the board retreat. Uh, uh, thanks to Mia and a couple others for suggesting. Uh, some facilitators. Uh, I've reached out to three. Um, one has rejected. One is considering. Uh, one is is um, willing. And Andrew and I talked to him this evening. Um, the one who's furthest along is, um, and actually was recommended by both Mia and um, Claire Wheeler. Did I get that right? Uh, uh, but as also, I just wanted to disclose a member of the community and uh, has relations as a friend with several board members, including myself, uh, which is Nathan Suter uh, and his organization, Bill, um, uh, would be very willing to do it um, and has put together a draft proposal, but also understands that the board has reservations about the fact that he is an active community member. So I just wanted to run that by the board again. Uh, you know, no promises have been made and I'm uh, talking to uh, another one I can reach out to more. But if anyone has concerns about Nathan, um, let me know just so we can, can do them the justice of not pursuing it further. But I, I, I think Nathan, Nathan would be good. I think he does a uh, he's well respected, and um, I think he's uh, able to, to to separate his his community hat from a facilitator hat. So. I would support Nathan as well. I think he's very professional and thoughtful, and I think he would do an awesome job.
All right, excellent. Uh, well, we'll continue talking to Nathan and uh, tell him that you know to build out this proposal and hopefully I can get uh, another one or or two. Um, and then I'm also working uh, with uh, Jill, um, sending out in the next couple of days a um, summary of kind of the conversations I had just to give people um, something to chew on. And then I think what what we'll do. Uh, we also put together some questions that would be good for folks to answer in anticipation of the retreat. I think before sending those out, I'm going to see what where we end up with the facilitator because I think the facilitator might want to, um, you know, add to those or uh, you know tweak them, be, and then kind of be the one who maybe sends it out and collects it. So, um, so those documents will be coming around soon. And then I actually think we have to, we have three dates on the calendar as holds, um, which if I recall, uh, 5th, 6th, and 13th. Um, do those dates still work for everyone? And do folks have a preference of which two of those mm -hmm. uh, work and don't work? I'm, I might've missed Perhaps. it, but I think it's just the 6th and the 13th. Yeah. On you took my the fifth off? Yeah. Okay, I still From got two, the fifth on. I still got the fifth on my two calendar. to five, okay. right? Yeah, two to five. Two to five. Yep. All right. I had the fifth sitting on my calendar too, and, and we didn't have the, the fifth as our regularly scheduled meeting, so that's why we didn't. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I have all the administrators coming on the fifth to do the continuous improvement plans. Just okay. FYI, <laughs> which I can change, and, but they're planning on that for the and for I'm, the board I'm meeting, right, Libby? just put out there, I think probably for Andrew's benefit more than anyone else, I am getting my second shot on the fifth and my first shot hit me pretty hard the second day. Uh, so Andrew, you, you may have elevated vice chair duties uh, on that first day of the retreat if I'm sitting there with like a bag over my head. But um, I'll, I'll be looking to somebody else on the Robert's rules because I'm very forgetful when it comes to, to Rob to Mr. Roberts rules. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll drop my copy in your mailbox. Um, all right, excellent. Anything else on on board retreat planning? Sorry, Jim, you you asked the question, but I didn't think I answered nor anybody else around the dates, and I'm still looking at my calendar, um, so I, I'm not sure what I was looking I, at to try to find out what you were talking about. So I thought we had um, a hold on three days, but apparently we don't. We just have a hold on two days, the sixth. So the first, the first part will be the sixth, and the second part will be the thirteenth, um, from two to five, I believe. So that yes. And for some reason, I have the fifth as a extra hold too, but um, I don't know why that ended up my calendar. So I was. Uh, my, my calendar was mistaken. So it's the 6th and 13th are the, the two days of retreat, and then we have a regular meeting um, the night of the day. Um, all right, uh, policy monitoring, uh, which I jumped to too quickly earlier, and Mia caught me on. Um, uh, so we have the, the D12, uh, Prevention of Employee Harassment, and D06, uh, Substitute Teacher. Um, and we need to approve both of them. Um, so, uh, why don't we have a motion to approve them? We can have discussion unless people, um, do not want to make a motion to approve or a motion to accept. I move that we accept the two policy monitoring reports provided by the superintendent. I'll second it. Second. Uh, discussion? I have, sorry, I have a discussion. Um, just the question because uh, the policy committee didn't look at this because we put the policy committee on hold until um, until after the retreat. And and so I'm, I'm wondering about the process. I have so that question. The, the process here is, um, Libby is 
is reporting compliance with the current policies, um, which were, you know, duly, duly approved by both the policy committee and the board a while ago. So we're not revisiting the policies or re-endorsing the policies. We're just, Libby's just reporting on compliance with the current existing policies. I see. And I just have one comment the, on the D2 prevention of employee harassment policy. The contacts are all about 80% out of date, which I'm sure you've noticed. Um, but we can we can update that at some point. Um, can any put other... a little asterisk there to say that the policy committee needs to update that language and gives my suggestion is to write it general so you don't have to do it every time there's a turnover. Yep. Okay. Um, so something that we had discussed, I think Amanda is touching on in the policy committee before Ryan left, we had discussed starting to get onto a schedule with Libby's compliance reports so that, you know, the week before she was reporting compliance on a policy that we would take a, a moment during our meeting prior to that um, to sort of touch base with the policy again and read it through and, and see if we felt like it needed any updating. Um, just to have it side by side with her compliance reports. It, it's also my understanding, Emma, you might want to check in with VSBA or somebody on the policy committee. I, I believe that the boards have to redo the policies every three years. Um, and so you'd be up to like next year would be a very busy year in redoing all the policies because they're all done at the same time when the merger right. happened. But, but we probably want to check on that because you want to, we'll have you to make do it. have a, ca a calendar does exist of when different policies expire. And I think you're absolutely right that there's a wave of um, renewing policies that needs to happen. Yeah, there is a wave. Yeah, and, and then uh, later. Ryan and um, Bridget had created some sort of calendar that I saw at one point. So I'm sure we could reach out to Ryan for that again. Yeah, and we might want to revisit. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things I noticed in the um, SRO policy uh, review, which is which is very true, was how things are were all written in kind of the negative. Um, and that's actually a vestige of our policy governance days. So that is how policy governance policies are supposed to be written in this like weird negative language. Um, and we actually, we, we redid the policies. We actually took a lot of that language out. Um, but you're right. We found it awkward at the time. And I think it continues to be awkward. Uh, we digressed a little. Um, uh, any further discussion on the approval of the the two policy reports? I'm gonna be the stone in people's shoes, and I, 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 you know, adopting things that are not finalized for me is bad practice. So if like there's change in language, can we put it on hold until we fix it and then vote on it? The, the, this is just the policy monitoring report. This isn't okay. the policy. But, yeah. we, but but we're saying that there needs to be some changes in there. Is that so? But yeah, that's, in, that's in Libby's report. So Libby is yeah. just reporting to the board, you know, here's where our district currently stands on this policy. So that's her compliance report. And sometimes she reports compliance and then other times she'll report non-compliance and then she'll make some notes. So those are notes for us to sort of, as the policy committee, to look at her notes and then, and then take action after that. But right, right now we're just talking about Libby's report of compliance on the, on the current policy. Yeah. yeah, and basically by not approving her report, we're saying we disagree with it. That either she reported compliance and we think we're in non-compliance, that she reported with compliance with some notes about, well, here's some things that need to be updated. And we say, no, we don't think they need to be updated. So us not taking action is basically saying that Libby's, that we disagree with Libby. Okay. Uh, 
Um, other comments? Uh, otherwise, I'll start with a vote. Anika? Aye. Uh, Emma? Aye. Mia? Aye. Amanda? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Jill? Aye. All right, Kristen? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Is everyone? See Andrew's, Andrew's cat's ready for him to, to be done. Andrew, why do you make a motion to adjourn? I, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Wait, Jill, Jill has her hand up. Hold on. Oh, Jill sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, Jill. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure when the appropriate time in the agenda was. I just want to let you folks know that tomorrow is the first of the Central Vermont Career Center board meetings that I'm I'm our representative on. So I'm thinking in so there's basically two meetings a month for the next couple months. So maybe on the agenda once a month, I can just give you guys a quick update at some point. Um, I'd be happy to. That's all. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jill. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah. Jill, I'm going to send you the board agenda. Like, if you don't have it, I'll just get it to the top of your, your inbox so you can just add a note for board discussion or board learning focus in there for me so I remember when we're okay. making the agendas. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Uh, that we adjourn the meeting for the evening? <laughs> uh, I, 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 let's count that as a second on Andrew's um, motion. Uh, Agate. Aye. Emma. Aye. Amanda. Aye. Uh, Jill. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Jerry. Aye. And Kristen. Aye. Great. We'll have a, a wonderful and me. break. And me. And oh, me. Aye. Mia. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mia. Uh, I vote to adjourn. Yeah. Um, have a wonderful spring break, everyone, and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Enjoy, Bye, everybody. everybody. Good night. Good night. Take care.